Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone, and welcome to Global Insights, the live streamed panel discussion which sheds light on big questions currently facing policymakers, planners, and researchers worldwide. Global Insights features experts from leading schools of international affairs, including the Balsillie School here in Canada, the American University in Washington, DC, Warwick University in the UK, the Ritsumeikan University in Japan, the Institute for Strategic Affairs in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and Constance University in Germany. Today's live stream panel discussion is entitled Practical Measures Supporting Climate Change Mitigation. My name is Anne Fitzgerald. I'm the director of the Balsillie School, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's session. A warm welcome to all of the participants in the audience today, and there are many of you. Please, if you have a question, direct it to us using the Q&A function on your Zoom panel, and we'll do our best to channel those questions to the relevant panelists towards the end of the session. Before we begin today's session, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. For those of you tuning in uh, to us outside of Canada, we, one of the actions we take here in Canada to advance reconciliation between settler and Indigenous peoples is to reflect on our relationship with the land and the continuous process of colonization that deeply impacts on our work. Acknowledging this land is the process of deliberately naming that this is Indigenous land and that Indigenous peoples have a right to this land. The Balsili School is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River, which is the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. It is particularly important that he, we here at the school acknowledge this land in all we do, including our Global Insights panels. We are privileged today to host four well-known experts in the field of climate change mitigation. John Morris is a teaching fellow in the International Political Economy in the Department of Politics and International Affairs at the University of Warwick in the UK. He holds a PhD in Economic Geography from Durham University. John is the author of Securing Financial, Mobilizing Risk, Money, Money Cultures at the Bank of England, which explores regulatory risk imagination at the bank over a 20 year period. He is currently working on a book manuscript looking at the political economy of tail risk, known as green swans. Jatin Nafwani is professor and the inaugural Ontario Research Chair in Public Policy for Sustainable Energy. He is the executive director of the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy here at the University of Waterloo, and he is uh, a leader of our STEM cluster for global resilience here at the Balsilli School. Simon Nicholson is associate professor in the School of International Service at the American University in Washington, DC. He co-directs the Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policy and is the director of the Forum for Climate Engineering Assessment. Tomoaki Nishimura is professor of international law and environmental law at the College of International Relations at Ritsumeikan University in Kyoto, Japan. He is interested in the lawmaking process and implementation of multilateral environmental agreements. Professor Nishimura has participated in most of the Conference of Parties of the UNFCCC since 1997 Kyoto Conference as a member of an NGO. Well, greetings to all of you and thank you for tuning in from all parts of the world. Um, I'd like to start by taking stock of the current state of affairs with respect to climate change mitigation efforts. Simon, I'd like to start with you. Um, we hear a lot that the world has 10 years to get climate change under control. Is this true? Uh, yes and no is the short answer. So Anne, thanks for the invitation to be with you today. Um, and thanks for inviting us all to be a part of this important series. Um, that, that date that you hear that we have a decade to do something about climate change has been in the news a lot lately. And it's come from a report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a couple of years ago saying that the world has about a, de a decade or so um, to try and prevent blowing through an important temperature threshold. Now that's a bit arcane. And what happens is that the international community is, is always setting new thresholds and new targets for action. The truth is that we have a decade to do all that we can on climate change. 
and next decade it will be the same. Um, climate change is not going away as a problem. It's a perennial challenge that now forever will be with us. And the, 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 the thing to acknowledge with climate change is that we always have to do more. And so I'm looking forward to the conversation today about the state of mitigation that is trying to prevent greenhouse gases from entering the atmosphere um, or to do something about those greenhouse gases once they're there um, to stop this human production of a, of, a, of a worsening climate situation. Thanks very much, Simon, for kicking us off. Uh, Jatin, I want to extend on that theme and ask you, what is at the core of the climate change problem that has not allowed us to make much progress on decarbonization globally? Cheap fossil fuels uh, remain at the heart of the global energy supply system. Uh, for example, uh, in the primary energy global supply, 85% share uh, in 1990 was fossil fuels. Three decades on, it is still 85%. Now, this reflects a, a historical legacy with trillions, of course, invested over the past five to six decades. So for the functioning of the economy, our dependency on fossil fuels is near absolute. I, I would say the equivalent of a monster holding you in an unyielding grip, grip. I mentioned cheap fossil fuels, but only in a manner of speaking. The, the cost of a, a massive environmental externality has not been imposed on the use of fossil fuels. Worse still is the massive subsidies to fossil fuels through the entire supply chain year over year. These subsidies are in the order of $5.3 trillion. This is from the NIMF report, or approximately 6.5% of the global GDP. So is it really any wonder that non-carbon solutions don't meet the test of so-called profitable uh, investment? Now, we often refer to the investment in the fossil fuel sector as a historical lock-in. And to shift direction of this titanic level commitment is, I think, a non-trivial problem. Thank you very much. Tomoaki, over to you now. You're calling in from Kyoto, so let's talk about Kyoto. What is the biggest problem or failure with the Kyoto Protocol? Uh, thank you. And the Kyoto Protocol indeed was groundbreaking in that it set quantified emission limitation or reduction objectives for industrialized countries and introduce market mechanisms such as the mission trading and the green development mechanism to cost effectively implement greenhouse gases reduction measures. However, the problem the Kyoto, Pro Kyoto Protocol was a non-participation of the United States, which was the largest emitter at the time the protocol was adopted. And the structure of the pro, uh, protocol made it impossible to convince emerging developing countries, particularly China and India, uh, to take action to reduction their emissions. And they had rapidly increased their greenhouse gas emissions after the protocol came into effect. And this problem uh, created a moral hazard and for example, Canada had withdrawn from the protocol uh, and from protocol in 2020 and 2012. And Japan and Russia uh, had rejected their objection and target to reduce their mission uh, during the second commitment period from uh, two, uh, 2013 to 2020. And this is a big problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, can you come in now and elaborate perhaps on why climate transition is viewed as a financial stability issue? Hi there, thanks, Anne. Uh, hi, everyone. So yeah, uh, in terms of thinking about uh, transition in terms of financial stability issue, I mean, often we might be concerned with the impact of, say, a discrete event and, say, kind of a physical risk and what that might do. But in terms of transition risk as, as a financial stability problem, um, this is going to be viewed as where the kind of actions that we might need to take now to mitigate against climate change, so things like policy change, um, this is going to change companies' reputations, it's perhaps going to lead to shifts in preferences, and it might also lead to big shifts in uh, asset values and uh, increased business costs. And uh, a lot of economists 
and financial regulators are concerned now about the impact of when you get a moment where you start to reevaluate your past investments or reevaluate what your company is worth, that can lead to a wide range of uh, behavior that might panicking behavior that might affect uh, wider financial stability, what we might call a climate Minsky moment after the um, the uh, famous uh, heterodox economist Hyman Minsky. Thank you very much. So three years ago, the world came together to adopt the Paris Climate Accord, which set some pretty bold targets. Tomaki, I want to come back to you and ask you um, what could be the advantages and disadvantages of the Paris Agreement over the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, and thank you. And the uh, advantage of the Paris Agreement is that it overcomes the challenges of the Kyoto Protocol and obliges all countries, including major emitter countries, and such as the United States and China, and to develop and publish their own climate change mitigation measures, which is set nationally determined contributions, so-called NDC. Uh, it is a soft and bottom-up regime because each country is free to decide on its own policy. And this is, a, and this is the uh, most advantage and, and in the uh, Paris Agreement. On the contrary, the disadvantage is that NDC itself is not legally binding. And therefore, the party agreement uh, cannot impose san uh, any sanctions if uh, each party fails to, uh, fails to achieve uh, its own NDC. Thank you. Thanks very much. Simon, we're three years out from the global stock take under the Paris Agreement, where countries are expected to advance a new round of mitigation pledges. Is the Paris Agreement working in your view? Well, that, that date three years from now is going to be a, a crucial test for the Paris framework. So the, the, the international community, that is the community of nation states, has been trying to work meaningfully on climate change as a problem area for some decades, since at least the 1980s. The first big agreement was in 1992, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Kyoto Protocol was appended to that. The Paris Agreement um, is under the UN Framework Convention as the newest way that the international community is trying to organize itself the climate action. And as Professor Nishimura pointed out to us, it's really based on a system of pledges from countries about what they will do. The global stock take in a couple of years is supposed to advance those pledges. It's supposed to uh, incentivize and, and actually force all countries to do more than they're currently pledging to do. And so if countries come forward with a new round of more ambitious pledges, then we can say the Paris Agreement framework is working. Um, but again, that date will be an important test of the framework. Thank you. John, how do you view the appropriateness of current practical technocratic approaches to climate change mitigation in the economic sphere? Oh, we, you're not, you're not um, coming in. There you go. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Sorry about that. Thanks, everyone. So, in terms of when we're thinking about um, technocrats, you know, we're thinking about these policy professional policy experts, and these are going to be quite knowledge based solutions. So things like introducing um, limits, new metrics, new ways of pricing, trying to make sure that perhaps um, pricing in the economic sphere reflects um, present and future climate risk. And in that sense, the, the 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 regulatory public side on it, I guess, is always going to be at a slight back foot in terms of the ability to invest in research, to invest in in knowledge experts, and in that sense, um, to be able to do something that isn't at the risk of intellectual capture by perhaps industries that. Um, that would like transition to work in particular ways that might not be the best possible or towards more um, pure governmental approaches, I guess. Does that help? It helps a lot. Jitin, um, can you elaborate on these governance challenges? What do you think are the key institutional and governance challenges which serve as a barrier to change? Public skepticism or indifference uh, translates into a a lack of political will and, and commitment. But I'll speak on that a bit later. Let me go to something more specific. 
Financing the global change away from fossil fuels will require investments in the order of three and a half to four or trillion dollars annually over the next 20 to 30 years. Now this calls for a deep pool of capital that does not demand a 14% return on capital. Now, this is one part of the answer in a range of choices. So how do we get there? Now, one approach is an economy-wide tax on consumption. For example, a 2 percentage point increase in the sales tax here in Canada, or GST or a VAT, in the Canadian context would yield approximately $20 billion per year. And if this ends up in general revenue, that won't help. But such an amount generated every year and then leveraged with industry can provide close to $50 billion of investment capital per year at low hurdle rates. Now, additional governance mechanism would obviously be necessary. So for example, if these investments are managed uh, through an arm's length entity similar to the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, for example, uh, and with a precise mandate for climate action, uh, it not only serves a uh, solves a governance challenge, but also uh, helpful in gaining uh, public acceptance. Uh, the rationale and, and, and subsequent management of the consumption tax revenues becomes a national symbol uh, for climate action. So. Thank you very much. Most uh, commentators out there would argue that mitigation is simply not enough, particularly if we are to avoid uh, an economic, a massive economic disruption moving forward. So John, back over to you. Recently, central banks and organizations such as the Bank of International Settlements have described extreme transition risks as green swans. Could you elaborate on what is meant by this concept and uh, the implications of such an idea of green swans? Yeah, so when we hear that term green swan, I think a lot of people will be more familiar with a term that has a bit more lineage, which is the black swan, which um, we have from, we've sort of been hearing since the 2000s from people like uh, Nassim Taleb. And in some respects, it's an attempt to build on that and capture some of the central thrust of the black swan concept. But I think it's doing a bit more, and it's probably doing a bit more in terms of um, politics and in terms of turning what we've already described as a private uh, public problem into perhaps a pri uh, uh, private one and one that's suited towards financial markets. So in that sense, when we think of our kind of traditional black swan concept, we think of um, events that might be very unexpected or rare. And we're going to think that these are going to have high impact. So they're low probability, high impact. And often these are going to be things that we, um, we just don't really have a sense of what has happened until after the fact, until after the event. And Wait. in distinction to that, sorry, oh, that's just a black swan. So no, in distinction no, no. to that, keep, the keep green going. swan, sorry, sorry, so in distinction to that, so the black swan um, is on that side and then the green swan is going to do something like that. So it's going to be saying, well, we've still got this level of uh, low probability and deep uncertainty. But at the same time, they're trying to capture a sense in which um, we don't know what these things will be, but we know there's a, a, a creeping, well, more than creeping inevitability about them. Um, we also know that perhaps these are just going to be extremely, extremely uh, serious implications than kind of a normal unexpected event. And the final one is, is just the greater complexity um, of these kind of events. And I think for me, um, the research that I'm doing at the moment is very much looking on how, picking up on what Tom Uaki said on um, this problem of moral hazard, since 2008, central banks have almost by default taken a lot more kind of liability and, and, and role for um, supporting uh, global economies and financial sectors. When things have gone wrong, and I wonder whether this is an attempt to um, demarcate what they are and are not prepared to kind of support and back up um, and intervene with. So we might want to think that this is, way, this is a way of saying, well, actually, none of our um, regulatory technologies are going to be particularly useful at, at any kind of idea of what this risk might be. So this really does need to be a private sector, more of a private sector in Syrianical solution. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Um, Jatin, back over to you. What role is there for adaptation strategies, rather perhaps than mitigation, such as the GHG reduction ideas, in order to address climate change? Thanks for that question, Anne. Uh, 
So beyond the role of uh, fossil fuels in climate change, uh, land use, uh, land use change and forestry practices not only contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, but they also have the capacity for sequestration of carbon. So what we call nature-based solutions provide actually a unique uh, opportunity for progress. The actions include you know, sustainable use of forests, management and uh, restoration of ecosystems, agricultural practices, and uh, preservation of biodiversity. Now, given Canada's huge land mass, forests, farmlands, grassland, peatlands, coastal lines and wetlands, and so on, all these offer really pointed opportunities for intervention and positive actions, not only to reduce emissions, uh, but to capture carbon. Now, there is an emerging view uh, that uh, regenerative agricultural practices, for example, can reduce uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide while boosting uh, soil productivity and increasing resilience to floods and droughts. The potential for uh, soil carbon sequestration is one natural uh, approach. Uh, you know, grasslands, coastal systems, again, are also quite efficient at uh, carbon sequestration. So this can become part of uh, what one might call a suite of solutions and this nature-based solutions should not be ignored as part of an adaptation mitigation strategy. Thank you very much. Simon, are all these mitigation responses um, enough and comprehensive? Are there any other responses or any other kinds of responses on the table for us at the moment? Well, I'll pick up then on Professor Matwani's uh, remarks there about nature-based responses, nature-based solutions, so-called. Um, mitigation, as traditionally defined, is about trying to keep greenhouse gases from entering the atmosphere. And the Paris Agreement redefines mitigation a little bit by talking about trying to balance between sources of greenhouse gas emissions and what are called sinks that would retrieve greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and put them into storage. Uh, biological pathways, these so-called nature-based solutions that might take greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in particular, into soils or into trees or into oce oceanic systems, um, uh, there are a large piece now of what we must think of as the mitigation response set, right? Um, the science on this stuff, though, is getting, is getting pretty tough to comprehend, um, just in terms of what climate math is now telling us about what's needed in terms of taking greenhouse gases from the atmosphere into storage. Um, all of human emissions of carbon dioxide each year right now equal about 40 gigatons, 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. By the end of the century, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is saying human beings may have to retrieve between, between 10 and 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere each year. The, 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 the scale of that type of enterprise is absolutely mammoth. And so nature-based solutions may be a piece of that response, um, but there are also other things to consider, so-called technological carbon removal responses um, that might in other ways bring carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, and some people, and I think Professor Nishimura might speak to this, are also contemplating what's called solar geoengineering, trying to reflect sunlight back into space as a way to buy time for these other options to be considered and take hold. Well, let's extend on that thought a little bit and over to you, Tomoaki. Can you talk to us about geoengineering? Can geoengineering be used as a tool to mitigate climate change? Uh, sorry. Hey, thank you. And let me introduce, uh, at, first, at first, let me introduce the geoengineering. And geoengineering means that the deliberate large scale manipulation of the uh, planetary environment uh, to counteract uh, anthropogenic climate change. And in geoengineering is generally divide, uh, divided to, uh, into two categories. Uh, First, the carbon dioxide remo removal, and the second is the solar radiation and management. And it is hoped that uh, geoengineering uh, could be used to achieve a dram uh, dramatic reductions in greenhouse gases. Um, however, uh, there are serious concerns that the influence will be so great and that it will have a negative impact on the other environmental issues. Uh, for example, uh, one of the carbon dioxide removal is ocean fertilization, uh, which refers to dumping ion fillings uh, into, uh, into the sea and to stimulate uh, 
phytoplankton growth in uh, in the area and that have and, uh, and found the same thing, uh, sorry and found the same good, uh, production and uh, convention on bio uh, biological diversity and the uh, london convention on the ocean dumping uh, have been uh, reluctant to use this technology because it is uh, considered a, a dangerous activity uh, from the uh, point of view of the uh, conserving uh, marine ecosystems. And thank you. Thank you very much. So all of this is political, and it seems as though the political will to act uh, among governments and private sectors has never been higher. So Jitin, can you speak to specific interventions at the national policy level with potential for most effective outcomes? Sure. Uh, legally mandated exits from use of fossil fuel is a clear and effective strategy with, with predictable outcomes. Exit from coal generation or a ban on, on gasoline fueled cars in the transport sector are, are emerging as credible options. Uh, countries after countries and cities after cities are announcing bans on gasoline, diesel transport, and, and the auto manufacturers are in a full pivot towards electrification of transport. So all this in the next 10 to 15 years, uh, in my view, holds enormous promise. But let me, let me point to one, one specific one, and this is uh, exit from coal uh, through legislated mandates. Uh, this has been effective in a number of jurisdictions, uh, and of course was achieved here in Ontario, uh, over a planned period, it took two, 14 years to do so. Similarly in Alberta, and now also Germany provides a very powerful example of exit from coal by around 20, 2035 or so. The, the key is actually good planning and, and full stakeholder buy-in. Uh, arrangements have to include uh, compensation for investors, of course, through payments uh, reflecting the residual economic value of the plant. Uh, but most important is the, the approach to managing what I would call the social and community impacts with uh, specific uh, uh, measures for labor force uh, retraining, support to communities and development of clean technology uh, solutions uh, and environmental remediation where that's necessary of the lands. So in, in the German case, for example, uh, of the approximately 50 odd billion euro of cost estimated over 20 years, a large proportion is dedicated uh, to community support and, and adjustment payments. Uh, so that's that's a promising example. But let me just summarize by saying, you know, we've tried incentive-based nudges through regulation and various policy prescriptions, such as fuel economy standards or feed-in tariffs and renewable portfolio trans uh, standard, carbon prices, etc. They all sort of work and they don't work. And the context, of course, is important. But above all, what they don't have is the urgency of a flashing red light. And so that's my preference for legislated mandates to actually get something done with predictable outcomes. Thank you so much. John, over to you and just let's just extend on this for a moment. Who in your um, uh, work and research is emerging as a major private sector actors uh, in the design and implication of practical transition measures? So I think here, I think for me, we need to look at um, a lot of market-based actors, including things like people, um, actors working in insurance and reinsurance, because they're going to be very much at the cutting head of things like risk modeling that is become kind of the prime, prime tool really in these technocratic solutions. And one big player here is going to be things like asset managers. And I think, um, I think it's reasonably uncontroversial to say that people like BlackRock at the moment are becoming hugely important here because of this ability to raise public awareness, which they have been doing about the need for transition, um, this ability to set the agenda in certain ways, uh, this ability to advise large institutions as they are with the Federal Reserve, and also um, this ability to draw up the kind of typologies that we might use in legal solutions and in more codified solutions. So to talk about what do we mean by kind of green and brown asset classes and investment classes. Um, the jury is still out on how progressive this role is going to be, but that's certainly, I think, where people are looking at it at the moment. Thanks very much. Um, Tomoaki, 
how can we improve future implementation efforts under Article 14, which of course has to do with the global stock take of the Paris Agreement? Thank you. And uh, Article 14 of the Paris Agreement provides as follows. And, and the meeting of the parties or, and to the agreement shall um, periodically take stock of the implementation of this agreement to assess the collective progress toward achieve, uh, achieving the uh, purpose of this agreement and its long-term goals. And this system is called global stock take. Uh, as I mentioned before, and the NDC of each party uh, in the party agreement uh, are not legally binding. And this is a serious problem. Uh, on the other hand, the party agreement is uh, of, and, and of really interest uh, not only to the United Nations and its, uh, uh, its party states, but also to many businesses, citizens, and local communities. And therefore, uh, it is so important for civil society uh, to take an interest uh, in their own national policies and to focus on setting up more, uh, more ambitious actions for climate change of its own, uh, uh, own uh, country. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Simon, over to you. Now, um, we have an, a US election coming up and uh, I'd love to hear your comments on what you feel the election uh, may do in terms of impacting on mitigation efforts, not just for the US, but globally. Uh, you've heard there's an election, have you, Anne? Yeah, rumor holds it. <laughs> uh, none of us are sleeping particularly well, in part because climate change is on the ballot at this election, right? And this is a, a phrase which you're hearing a lot in climate circles in the United States. If the current administration has another four years in office, then not only are we going to see um, increased pressure on the international effort to respond to climate change, the U.S. has already announced intent to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, and that would take hold immediately after the election. Um, and U.S. leadership, of course, is now absent under this current administration in the international climate change response conversation. Uh, not only that, but the domestic uh, climate change response coordinated through the federal government is in tatters and will be further um, uh, further taken apart with another four years with the current administration. Um, on the other hand, if uh, we have a, a new Biden administration in the United States, then there seems to be promise for quite sweeping potential re-engagement with international uh, climate efforts um, and also a new round of uh, federal government-led domestic action on climate change. Um, this, this, is a, this is a US election with massive potential implications for how the world looks, not just decades from now, but hundreds or thousands of years from now, given that that's the scale on which climate change operates. Thanks for sharing that really, really important point. Um, before we turn to the audience for their questions, I'd like to get your thoughts, uh, thoughts from all of the panelists on some of the practical things that are being done to mitigate climate change. So Simon, I'd like to start with you again and ask what uh, are some of the most exciting mitigation related actions taking place right now and on the horizon? Yeah, it's, it's, that's an interesting question because it's, it's tempting to think about the climate change challenge and in particular the mitigation challenge as purely a technological challenge or a technological set of questions. And of course it's not. Technologies are embedded in social and political systems um, and as Professor Nathani pointed out, we have this weddedness to fossil fuels, which is not just because fossil fuels are a great way to kind of store and transmit and utilize energy, um, but because we have social and political arrangements which, which hold that system in place. Right? And so to, to move to a new set of technological and um, civilizational imperatives requires massive social and political change. And so for me, the most important um, things that are happening around mitigation right now are just the, the kind of renewed energy from youth activists, um, from people coming together to imagine different futures that take us beyond the fossil fuel economy um, through divestment uh, from fossil fuel enterprises. Um, and by thinking just really hard about what a Green New Deal, to use the language that's used in the United States, might look like post the COVID era. Right? There's, a, there's a moment now of crisis 
that needs to be leveraged to start to produce a better world. And that's social activity that I think is, is, is kind of bubbling up right now. John, what do you see as the strengths and limitations on measure de measures designed to align the prices of assets with their negative impact on the climate and transition mitigation strategies? Yep, so I think just, um, just relating to what Andrew has just said there in terms of um, this sense now that actually markets perhaps have been very bad at pricing uh, financial assets um, and that perhaps in the past regular attitudes towards um, markets has been one of market neutrality and this idea has actually often translated into uh, protecting asset values and in that sense I think just to echo what Andrew said um, I think we've got a, a moment now where people very serious people uh, like 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 Christine Lagarde are questioning um, this principle of market neutrality and this principle of saying well can you start doing things that start to intervene in pricing mechanisms big problem here at the moment is obviously how do you do that and one way that some of the big research institutes places like the Bank of England are looking at at the moment is can you get banks to imagine future scenarios involving mitigation and say well how much would each of these cost and getting them to think about it in that case of can we cost in different prices for what a transition would look like. And that is really exciting. Um, the only issue is, and you know, it's just a, the minor issue of politics, right? And how do you draw up that kind of mechanism? How do you, what kind of assumptions does everyone have to agree to so that people think that these kind of, these kind of technological hypothetical prices are actually credible? And that seems to be a big issue at the moment in terms of what kind of methodology should be um, used. And also, do we think that governance institutions are going to, at the end of the day, uh, provide public support at particular crisis points? Thank you very much. Tomoaki, all things about Kyoto project from Japan. Tell us about what Japan is doing and what it intends to do in your view on climate change mitigation. Thank you. And, and according to uh, today's broadcast, as the new Japanese Prime Minister and uh, Yoshihide Suga uh, will make a speech at the Diet, and Diet is a Japanese parliament, and that the Japanese government will pledge to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to uh, net zero uh, by 2050. And in the past, and the Japanese government has explained that it will reduce uh, uh, reduce emissions by 80% by 2050, and that it will be a uh, virtually zero as early as possible in the second half of this century. And the lack of a clear timeline has been criticized for uh, being vague and uh, reluctant to deal with uh, environmental problems. And this uh, new uh, target means uh, Japan uh, will finally catch up with the European Union and which uh, European Union set the same goal last year. Uh, it is important to achieve this goal. Um, but I think in the Japan, uh, as um, one of the Asian developed, uh, developed countries, uh, should coordinate global climate change policy uh, with Pan-Pacific state, uh, Pan states, including uh, US, Canada, and China and established a regional forum and to combat climate change and similar to the European Union. Thank you. Thanks very much. Jitin, over to you on this final question. Can you identify a few critical pathways and practical measures that will accelerate change? Sure. Uh, deep electrification of all sectors of the economy is a value-added proposition uh, for a global transition. Uh, what this allows you to do is change the supply mix to non-carbon sources uh, cost-effectively. Uh, and, and we are quite capable of doing that. Uh, and, and, and in addition, where electricity is not a viable solution, and it is not in a number of contexts, uh, uh, both efficient use of uh, high and low-grade heat sources for residential, commercial, and industry sectors, are again uh, different credible options that that uh, are on the on, are available. Uh, more specifically, turning to the investment front, uh, 
I would say rapid uh, divestment of divestment with teeth, let's call it, is one effective uh, strategy. Uh, but better still, and John, John has touched upon this earlier, so I won't elaborate much, is a requirement for, for full disclosure of climate risk liability uh, related to investment in fossil fuels. Uh, and, the, and, and, and for the boards of these corporate entities to completely and fully acknowledge the potential for stranding of assets, and that might uh, change the direction in a way that I say, follow the money and you might see some action. And of course, last but not least, uh, providing a nature-based solution that I discussed earlier is one part of the solution. Thanks very much. Jatin, I want to push on one issue that uh, reflects a number of the questions coming in from the audience uh, asking about science and policy and the gap that exists between uh, good science and good policy. So how big do you think is this gap? And are we breaking down barriers to bring it together or not? Like on the panel today, we've got representatives from STEM and social science. You know, how, how, how much are we friends and how much are we uh, acquaintance, acquaintances? Well, if you, if you look at the situation in the United States, in a, it's an abyss and it's a chasm. There's a, there's a, there's a disconnect between science and policy that's uh, quite, uh, quite disheartening. Leaving that aside, uh, uh, I, I see, uh, you look at Germany or Europe uh, in general, even here in Canada, uh, the alignment of uh, science, science policy, science-based solutions, the idea that, that uh, science provides an objective basis and measure for action uh, in the political realm. And we've seen it in COVID here in Canada, we've seen it in New Zealand, we've seen it in other countries. That is room and comfort uh, for hope that, uh, that the disconnect uh, globally is not as wide as what may appear emerging out of the United States between science and what science can do and how it can influence uh, good public, public, public policy outcomes. Thanks very much, John. I, I saw you nodding your head and you're coming in from you know, a political science perspective, but also from an a, a economic and finance perspective as well. So um, what's your view on this? Yeah, well, I think you know, I, uh, already Jetin, you know, is 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 pushing in um, or the core areas here, which is you know going to be thinking about um, ideas of uh, pricing and disclosure and kind of this gap between um, what's going on in terms of uh, policy commitment to science and 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 get, getting that advice in. And I think yeah, um, I think as I've tried to talk a bit about already. Um, the idea about better data is going to fix things. I mean, we know there are limits with what markets can do with processes and what markets can do with data in the first place and what, and, and what people can do with that data. Um, I think also uh, just this idea that we want to kind of keep these two areas, say you can have you know, good policy and good, uh, and, 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 and good science together. Um, perhaps we should start seeing how embedded sciences within politics and vice versa so in that sense again it's about thinking well um well who is being asked to add expertise here um, and is there overtly um at the moment a a, a a set of techniques that are very much not geared towards taking radical political change and more um tweaks and small fixes when a status quo thanks very much simon any views on that issue Uh, well, I mean, there's a straightforward way to think about action around uh, environmental challenges like climate change, which is that science points out that there's a challenge and then it's up to the political system to work out what the responses are. Now, of course, that really simplistic understanding of the way that this whole thing should operate just does not work in practice because there's massive politicization of the science um, and science can't tell us what kinds of futures that we should be pushing towards or what kinds of actions need to take place. Um, that really does depend on social and political processes. Uh, right now, as Professor Nathlani is pointing out, in countries like the United States where I'm currently sitting, there's just a complete breakdown in terms of relations between the scientific community um, and, and political and social processes. Massive distrust of science amongst many segments of society and politicians who just play silly games with basic things. 
um, in a country in the United States that has become so polarized around climate change as an issue that the easiest way to work out where somebody stands on climate change is to ask them their political affiliation. There's, there's, there's kind of no way past that except for um, uh, social and political transformation. It requires a different understanding of, of how we're going to move forward. Um, so, you know, uh, Professor Nathani pointed to hope. At the moment, I'm, I'm not feeling too great, honestly, um, about, about the potential for climate action based on what the science tells us. Uh, Bill McKibben, uh, for a long time, a well-known writer on climate change in the United States, said what we need is just to put the right science into the right hands and things will change. Um, now he and many other activists are saying that's not what we need. We need just to generate the social and political action that's going to be moving us in the right direction because more science can actually lead to more polarization as people entrench around the science that they tend to agree with. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on because more questions are coming in. Uh, Tomoaki, a question for you has arrived. Um, Japan has invested considerably in nuclear energy. Where does nuclear fit into this discussion? Um, and also, if you'd like to just give a comment, um, there's another question of what we can expect out of COP26. Yeah. Uh... Uh, as we know, the and the COP and the and twenty six uh, postponed the, the and the next years, and I uh, would like to uh, participate in this uh, the conference in the, in the UK, and, but the uh, the conference of parties uh, has uh, 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 a lot of the um, uh, issue to and uh, in the, the and the uh, and. Uh, the, uh, of the, the United uh, UNFCCC and the uh, Paris Agreement, the, and uh, I think uh, this is, uh, uh, um, and uh, I think it is important to the uh, uh, stop and establish the and the and the moment of the and the global stock take and the uh, as uh, fourteen and uh, as uh, I mentioned and uh, before. And it and it and so uh, it is and so uh, uh, important to the um, that uh, and sorry the and and, uh, and civil society and must uh, check and to the uh, criticize the uh, and um, and uh, and it uh, own country the other country and uh, and. And, and for example, uh, the uh, environmental and, and environmental NGO and, uh, uh, and climate action network, and said uh, uh, they criticized the uh, and and and. Uh, and Sorry, they could uh, criticize the, and, and for example, the uh, Japan, uh, the Canada, and the, and the European Union, and then the China, and then and, and we uh, check and uh, this and moment and uh, and in the future. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. No, no problem at all. Um, another uh, well, a set of questions are coming in, all focusing on uh, the European moves recently. Um, so from an international politics perspective, uh, to John maybe, how do you evaluate um, the recent, uh, what's being labeled here by some questions is aggressive EU policy action towards climate change, including the EU taxonomy and the EU Green Deal. Um, these policies begun to influence financial industry and huge capital are moving from brown to green energy. Is this part of a battle for supremacy of political power among EU, US and China? Uh, over to you. I think this is a, a really, really great question. Um, and I think here we do want to think, okay, there's been a lot of um, narrative and discourse in Europe at the moment on making this change, these changes, like drawing up things like a, 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 a taxon uh, taxonomy. But I think, I wonder whether we do want to just see this as kind of a combined um, European effort and consensus within particular governments, because obviously this is also about um, financial sectors and not particularly, not always particularly um, cohesive 
interests within these sectors. So first of all, I would say that we want to think about this taxonomy as an ongoing process and thinking about, well, who particularly from private sectors having an input into that taxonomy. And in the European level, these are always the kind of really, really big political discussions with technical financial solutions of thinking about which banking sectors in which area, in which countries, in which perhaps more powerful or less powerful countries are going to be affected by such policies. That's a huge part of technical solutions um, in things like things like stress testing of uh, financial stability more generally. And then the other side of this is just going to be well thinking, even if you did have a lot of action, like, um, you know, through ECB bond purchases, at the moment, a lot of um, this recent workout, I think, from uh, policy researchers at the LSE, looking at the way that asset purchases by central banks, like the Bank of England and like the ECB, have been skewed towards things like uh, brown assets and fossil fuels still. And that partly reflects the already composite nature of these sectors. So in that sense, um, we might want to start saying, well, what has been done and what hasn't been done? So I think at the moment, we'd probably want to start seeing um, more activist, and I think in terms of kind of policy recommendations, we're going to see people really, really pushing right now for more activist corporate bond purchases that really start to uh, stop buying fossil fuel um, fuel moves. So, so I think that definitely there is an attempt to shape the narrative in that direction. But I'd say at the moment, um, it might be shaping up in that way. But I think in terms of just looking at it in terms of EU, US, and China, there are going to be lots of different groups cutting and intercleavages between that in terms of financial sectors, publics, and that type of thing. So in that sense, um, from my perspective, it's a very, very messy, messy problem. As a researcher, that's quite interesting. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's a picture that I really need to see. You know, we, I, I think we just need more time on this. But I think the potential is definitely there for that kind of issue coming. Great, thanks very much. Jitin, um, some questions on taxes. And that's a big issue here in, in Canada at the moment, appeared in the newspaper yesterday. What are your thoughts on measures like carbon taxes and uh, cap and trade? The, the, the carbon tax and cap and trade have turned into, in my view, uh, a needless uh, political uh, dogfight. Uh, I, I, I'm very much a supporter of carbon tax where it works. Uh, the problem has been um, that uh, is it steep enough and deep enough to deal uh, high enough to to really deal with the kind of challenge we have in front of us with respect to the urgency to do something about climate change uh, effectively. And in that spirit, you know, if you're looking at anywhere from 80 to $110 per ton of carbon uh, penalty or price, uh, the political consequences of that uh, are also something that's very difficult for politicians. Uh, think of the Gilets jaunes in France, you know, small increase in tax on diesel uh, kind of created a near revolution as it were in the, in the society. So I think the equitable distribution of, of uh, burden of tax, and that's why I'm very much a supporter of consumption tax spread widely and, and it can be done, it's a progressive tax, can be done uh, positively is one answer that might not see a kind of political backlash that you've seen when you just target a very specific group of truck drivers, if you wish, uh, with respect to taxes on diesel and what have you. So uh, it is a difficult problem and, and, and requires much deeper attention and, and, and thought. Thanks very much. Um, Simon, can I come to you and ask you what your thoughts on the European initiative uh, is, are, um, is it enough in your view? Well, they're, they're, they're showing the way for other countries in terms of pledges, right? And of course, pledges need to translate into action. The European Union as a whole has a better record than most when it comes to actually following through on pledges. Um, the, the interesting dimension of that question for me is that from the international relations perspective, we tend to think about everything in the international system as a jockeying for position. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's, that's true in part that the United States has left a big leadership vacuum around the international climate response and China and the European Union have a role to play and a, and a role to fill. But most of the interesting action is actually domestic. You know, you've got a, a cadre of people in the European Union, around the European Parliament and others who kind of get climate change and for a long time have been pushing for more aggressive action and a consolation of civil society actors who are driving in that direction as well. In China, the dynamics are a little different. 
in China, you've got a, 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 a government that depends for its legitimacy on dealing with domestic environmental health-related uh, problems, that is, uh, people are choking on bad air. And dealing with that becomes part of Chinese climate change response because cleaning up that air is also a recognition that we need to transform energy systems uh, to do something about climate change. Um, and so the, the, the domestic politics of this, I think, is where the action is in most cases. Thanks very much. I want to wrap up this session by acknowledging that there are policymakers in the audience today. And um, I'd like to ask all of you if you can give them your top tip or uh, an issue which is on the forefront of your mind for their consideration moving forward. Tomoaki, let's start with you. What's your um, biggest message to the policy world? Okay, and, and environmental issues and now well, very high political issues and in the, in the world and the national sovereignty is in conflict. And climate change, and I think climate change is one of the most difficult problems to solve. And however, and present generations need to work together in, in terms of the protecting the global uh, global commons and uh, passing on a better global environment to uh, future generations. And to this end, uh, I hope uh, that uh, scientific knowledge and civil society and, and uh, industry uh, will be a uh, careful taken and uh, into account and. Uh, and ambitious reduction actions and uh, will be implemented uh, implemented uh, within the framework of the party agreement. Uh, I think, thank you. Thank you very much. Jitin, your number one top tip for the policy world. Simple act, act now on all fronts and engage with communities early and often. Uh, rather than criticize politicians, we need to build up the white space required for politicians uh, to feel comfortable in promoting uh, bold initi initiatives. We need to get our hands dirty uh, and we need to engage with uh, politicians and communities to, to highlight uh, credible pathways. And what is really, really important, uh, of course, as scientists, uh, uh, I, I, I quote Churchill on this, you know, scientists, uh, uh, not on top, but on tap. That's what you need to be able to help our politicians uh, uh, get to where we need to get to. Great, great quote to leave us with. Um, Simon, what's your top tip that you want to share to the policy world? I'll, I'll get something a little narrower, building on another piece of the conversation we've had. That is, the science now tells us that removing large amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is going to be essential as a component of humanity's climate change response but not all forms of carbon removal are created equal. And so there's real work to be done on the policy front now to set guardrails for effective investigation into what removing carbon from the atmosphere might look like um, and how it might contribute to not just uh, benefiting those who already have power, but to the broader goals of social transition uh, in the service of climate action. Thanks so much. And John, finish us off. So I think, I think just just trying to pull this across what everyone is saying right now, I think from different angles is um, don't lose this moment, right? This is a huge impetus right now for change and also um, for various governmental tools and powerful governmental tools are currently being talked about and used a lot. And there are people open to, you know, new ideas in terms of dealing with um, the debt problems of, 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 um, of developing countries, as well as, you know, how do we use powerful tools like quantitative easing? And I think that question would be to really, really question these overriding assumptions about economic governance to do with market neutrality about keeping politics out of the market or at least um, encasing the market from politics and saying well this actually requires political activism and this is the time to try and do it. Thanks so much and thank you to all of you you've been brilliant it's been such an interesting panel from so many different disciplinary perspectives thank you to you to the, to the audience for tuning in with us we hope everybody will join us next week same time same virtual link um, for a very interesting and timely discussion on election interference and misinformation. Until then, take care and stay safe.